Hi, this is Edwin Samuelson, and welcome to The Cinephiles. Uh, today, we are in a new surroundings. Uh, this is, happens to be Eric's apartment, and we're going to be trying a new type of show. Uh, in fact, we're going to be discussing uh, one of Jeff's topics, which is, are they that great? And uh, today, we were joined by my co-host, to, uh, well, to, to the very end here, Mr. Michael Foltz. Hello. And to his left, Mr. Jeff Gallishaw. Hello out there. Mm -hmm. And... We're, and don't forget, let's not forget Eric Cohen. Uh -huh. Veteran dinner theater performer with a toothbrush. But let's get started because somebody's got a hygiene to be more concerned with. <laughs> um, now, Jeff, this is let's get yeah. into it. Jeff, this is your topic. Are they that great or in parentheses overrated? I hope that was toothpaste. Um, now, this is your topic. Tell me why you decided to pick this topic today and uh, tell us a little bit about what this topic is. Okay, well, I got tired of always like listening to movie critics and they're saying, oh, this movie is great, this movie, like a Merchant Ivory movie, that is great, that, you know, certain people well, like, that. yes, but it makes it hard for the average moviegoer to sit through. And I started thinking about certain classic films, like recently I've been watching a lot of classic films, and you know, you hear about them all these years about how great they are, then you sit through them, and they're so excruciating to sit through. So I just decided, I know I can't be the only one who feels this way. So I thought, you know, maybe open it up and, you know, let voices be heard. I'm glad you brought that up, the Merchant Ivory Connection, because I have a theory about that. I call these movies the yuppie snob movies, where anything that has an English accent and a costume is automatically considered a masterpiece, even if the movie totally sucks. That's where the pretension comes in. Absolutely. I, I remember uh, years ago, uh, there was a movie called Ethan Fromm. Uh, which I've, came out. I've heard about it. I could not it. believe. I remember walking by, like, "Ooh, what the hell is playing?" Was that a Merchant Ivory film? Though? No, but it's it you know, it's an old type, you know, snobby movie where the people are just right. for these yuppies on the upper east side. Was Liam Neeson in that? Yes, he was with uh, Ed Patricia Arquette. <laughs> and uh, the thing that's sad is that I was like, "What is this? It looks like a line for Star Wars, but it was a line for this snobby movie, which no one, I guess, mean, well, some people saw it, but it did, you know, no one remembers it now." Was it the Paris? No, it was at the Tower East over on the east side, which is a huge theater. Exactly. But people think just because they have an English accent and are wearing these costumes, it's automatically a great movie. And that's so, come on. Exactly. Some have an English accent and have costumes that suck. And I get tired of sitting through So like you're, you're, are, are, they not, are, are, they, are they not that great, whatever the name of our topic is? It, it's, it's basically you're talking about Merchant Ivory films. Yeah. No, no, it's not only Merchant Ivory films. It's that, that's just a... a I guess a production company that tends to put out a bunch of movies. They're always critically lauded, and they say that or that great, but then when you actually sit through it, it's some of the most boring stuff you'll ever watch. Yeah, people think because of their reputation, they might have made some really good movies, but they're living on the name, not the actual quality of the current product they're putting out. Exactly. Instead of like judging it individually, they just hear Merchant Ivory automatically. But don't you think, I mean, you guys are making a point with the Merchant Ivory, but don't you think there are certain films out there, maybe not so... Uh, within a classification of, let's say, a, a period piece. But don't you think there's a lot of film classics out there that there's kind of a bully pulpit that is saying, you're out of your mind or your opinion doesn't matter if you don't like this because everybody else says it's a classic? And you're sitting there going, am I the only one that thinks this is really not that great or a piece of shit? And I think there's a real... Because some of these Hollywood movies that you see these days, I, I'm scratching my head and figuring out what people saw of them in the first place. Well, it's, I think every... Well, it depends. On, though, it depends. I mean, there, there's... First off, this topic is about classics, right? That's what I thought it was about. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, Merchant Ivory, classic. is that really classic? No, no we well, were just going out on a tangent. Because there's different... There's, different, there's, different, there's films that are, like, critically acclaimed across the board that are commercial Hollywood product that come out, like, now. That, I wouldn't say, fall into classic territory. And I would say that there are people that will praise it because it works within the context of being slick commercial product and, and it hits all the notes in that way, whereas there are other people that will hate it for that very same reason. Uh, but if we're talking about films like their classics, where we're told of the genre with the Dard stuff and things yeah, like exactly. that. Citizen Kane is the perfect. But I, I don't know, I, you know what? That's, that's a whole other Sometimes interesting Sometimes I discussion. feel that film school, and you know, Eric and I both uh, went to film school, and. Uh, uh, people we've known went to film school, and don't you think that sometimes what the film professors like mm -hmm. are very different than, let's say, the AFI 100 like? It's, yeah, well, yes, and but look at who's choosing the films for AFI 100. You know, I, I doubt it that my one of my college professors would have thought Wizard of Oz was one of the top ten best movies of all time. I highly doubt that. 
Um, I'm sure Alphaville would have been up there in the top five. You know, well, that's not even mentioned at all. Let me give a perfect example. Like, uh, people are two also from different generations and different sensibilities. Like yeah. one movie, which I think actually, you talk about movies that are considered classics, which I think is the most overrated movie, one of the most overrated movies, if not the most overrated movie ever made, is The Graduate. It's number nine, and to me, a travesty that, that Vertigo is number 50 something on the list. Mm -hmm. Vertigo is such a much better film. It is groundbreaking, and we're still, I mean, it's known as Alfred Hitchcock's most personal film. How can that be 50-something and The Graduate's, like, number, I think, eight or nine? I don't well, know. I think maybe the reason is because, like how he was saying about Hollywood and its conventions, I think The Graduate is more of a crowd pleaser and more a film people can look back on fondly, whereas when you watch Vertigo, if you're not really in the mood to watch it, it's challenging for you, and it makes you think, and certain audience members don't necessarily like that. Whereas if you appreciate film, you know, you more or less appreciate Vertigo. Also, too, you know, you have to look at a film like those two examples that you just made. Uh, Vertigo doesn't really have a catchphrase. <laughs> That's maybe what kind of hurts it in the, uh, the, uh, the, the yeah, cult of personality of particular agree. films. Whereas The Graduate, you know, Plastics. You know, then you got. Or are you trying, trying to seduce yeah, Mrs. But, but Robinson? It, I mean, you I hear what you're saying, like, well, but at the time Vertigo came out, there was no such thing as a catchphrase kind of film that didn't gauge the success of the film. At that it does time. have a visual catchphrase. I mean, the problem with Vertigo was at its time it was a very controversial film, not just because of the subject matter, but because of the casting choices. I mean, no one had ever seen Jimmy Stewart play such an unsympathetic part like that before, and had a very dark ending and. It was, it was a very, like Evan said, it was a very personal film for Hitchcock during an era where not too many directors made personal films. Yeah, you but know? I mean, but even today, Graduate is still more well-remembered than Vertigo is. But it depends on for, from whom, from whose standpoint. There, there will be a whole school of film fans that be like, I consider Vertigo to be one of the ten greatest movies of all time. Graduate, eh. Yeah, but, you know, but if you, let's whereas say... I, whereas I think that Vertigo is probably like, not even in my top five favorite Hitchcock No, I mean, I, 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 like, I, I have a lot of admiration and respect for Vertical. I think it's a very interesting film. I think it's a well-made movie and a daring film from Hitchcock, but it's not my favorite Hitchcock. Yeah, but let's say if, really? if we it's actually real, seriously. went out on the street and asked somebody which film they had actually heard of, more people would recognize the name The Graduate than Vertigo. You know what I think it is? It's like you said. I think that it came along at the right time. It's very dated now. It's yeah, very of course. It graduate caught, or caught, Vertigo? The grad graduate, because it caught on this thing with you know the me generation, you know the you know the pre. It, it was more of a generational. The type end of film. the uh, the end of the hippies and the beginning of like the me generation, and and you look at it now like the plastics comment, you know that's it's very dated. And Vertigo to me is a timeless film. I think it's just because of the reputation it had at the time, people are still remembering that time. Another thing, if you want to put the, these two films into debate, another thing that may hurt it within the public public consciousness is the fact that Benjamin, the Dustin Hoffman character, is a very likable person that you can root for. And you could not find a further person to root for with Jimmy Stewart. Oh, I, I mean, see. he's a... At He's somebody, he is very unsympathetic in that film. Oh, I the, ir the irony of that statement about The Graduate, because I, I'm going to disagree with you, I think The Graduate is a really good film. And, yeah, I, think it's, and it's, I think it's, it's, it's there's a lot more there than, than you're, you're, you, you may have realized or right. recognized. It like the fact good. that Dustin Hoffman's character is not a sympathetic. I don't in fact, he's a very selfish character. But selfish much character. more sympathetic but, but, than Jimmy Stewart. in a way where you, you could be lured and thinking, oh, this is a, 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 you know. I disagree with that, because Jimmy Stewart, when his, I mean, I don't want to get to a whole Vertigo debate, when, um, Well, I don't disagree with you on, on Jimmy Stewart either. I agree. Yeah. His is very dark. That's because he really, you really feel for him when he loses the woman that he loves, and he's trying to make the, the other person look just like her. You understand why he's doing it, but yet you're really upset for him, you know. I, the graduate, like he said, I think the character was very you know, snobbish and greedy and, you know, just didn't give a shit. Well, what about something like, I mean, we're, we're talking about stuff that we tend to yeah, not be fixated and interested in talking about, but what about something that is considered, like, classic, like Gone of the Wind? Uh, have we seen that, and do we think it's as good as, does it deserve its classic status? Well, personally, I think it's a very boring movie. I think it's just a big bloated soap opera. Well, because I've heard that so many times to this point, I still haven't brought myself to sit through Gone with the Wind. And, be, and because nobody told me before the segment to watch Gone with the Wind, <laughs> I have yet to see it myself, so I really can't. And you consider yourself film yeah. yeah, Yeah, but I, I, I can bring up a film I hope that maybe we've all seen, Casablanca. Right. Now, I, for some odd reason, have always put off seeing it, like, most of my life. And then finally I took the plunge and watched it. And I actually ended up really enjoying it more than I expected to. And, you know, like, I, I've heard some people complain, 
oh, it's too long, but I, I mean, the film's only an hour and 42 minutes, and it just flies by, and there's it so ju much. It just feels that long. It's it okay. feels like a two hour and 42 minutes. Well, I'm in jazz camp. I like Hasselblad. I think it's a. I think it amazes me that they were literally writing that film like when they started shooting, mm -hmm. and that somehow it came together. And after they were started shooting, like, they were originally supposed I mean, to start after Ronald they finished Reagan. it. They, they, they exactly. dubbed it. Um, but but I think it's a very well written film. It feels full, and, mm -hmm. and there's, there's there's more. Well, see, what I, the reason why I was sort of looking forward to this topic is because we tend to talk about films after a certain era. We never get into, you know, like the classics, the stuff pre 1960 mm -hmm. even. We tend to, you know, maybe we'll lightly touch on a subject like in a caper film episode. We'll talk about like Kubrick's The Killing or something like that. But outside of that, it's like we never really talk about this whole other era of filmmaking, which set these, you know, say what you will about them. Maybe you think some of them are boring, you don't like them, but you know, they set the precedent for what we like today. Well, that's why something like Casablanca amazes the hell out of me. It's slow, it's boring, it's got a leading man that not really that great a charisma in my mind. Um, Ingrid Bergman is about the best thing in it. She's, she's beautiful. You just don't like his performance in this, or you don't like Humphrey Bogart as an actor? I didn't like his performance in this. And I, I will say, though, I've seen a little bit over a half a dozen Humphrey Bogart films. And I will say that, in my opinion, I find him to be a much more compelling and interesting villain than he is a hero. I think that's when his acting chops, like with uh, the Kane mutiny, where he teeters on the brink of madness, then just goes right over the brink. Treasure of Sierra Madre. The tre yeah. Treasure of the My Sierra Madre. He, really he's both uh, an evil man and he's crazy as a shithouse rat. And those are two of the best performances. Whereas this, I felt like he was relying on this like world-weary charisma that I didn't think he had. I have a problem with his like lisp and his overbite and his weird delivery. And he looks like three times older than Ingrid Bergman. So I'll I didn't give you see that, that little point. And I and I didn't. I, I found this is about this is a time this is a, a World War II film. This is about the you know the French resistance and how it's alive and well in Casablanca, uh, in the you know the northern part of Africa. And uh, you're dealing with Nazis. You're dealing with resistance fighters. You're dealing with uh, you know a, um, uh, you know an American that's basically a patriot away or a, not a patriot but a uh, but anyway. Uh, I just found I found some of the dialogue cute. It had some good one-liners like uh, Nazis outlawed miracles. That, that's a, that's a good line. Or you had a good. Nobody has a good sleep in Casablanca. You know these like rat a tat tat like cute little one-liners. But I think I, I I found every I found all the characters to be about as believable as a cardboard cutout. I found that these foreign guys that were quote unquote foreigners, mm -hmm. they, they barely held up their end of the deal on their accents. Uh, I, found, I found the film to have about as much, like I said, you're dealing with World War II, you're dealing with Nazis and resistance fighters and everything. I found this film to have about as much menace as the town, or the play Our Town. Uh, I, honestly, I felt, even when they're shooting at each other. And I, I you've was, never seen a play Our Town. Are you talking to the audience? Or <laughs> I fall asleep here. This is going on too long. Now. But uh, <laughs> so you, you, you don't like that? Yeah, obviously. You so I, 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 I hate the movie. Uh, I, love I, the I didn't hate it, but Michael Curtis does nothing spectacular visually in the film. I mean, I was like, I I, I don't know. I, I I think I think it's an interesting. I think it's a very well written film. I think that you have to with the history of that film. I'm not trying to excuse it. It was meant to be a B picture that somehow in the last minute got upgraded being an A picture. So it was supposed to be a B cast, supposed to be a low budget. Humphrey film. Bogart was too and suddenly the last they're like, choice. No, we want to put Humphrey Bogart and, and Ingrid Bergman because they're hot now, so let's do this. But but uh, I guess we should move forward. I thought right Claude Rains was more interesting than Humphrey Bogart. Well, Claude, well, I love that. I thought their dynamic was the best dynamic in the film. I thought they had the most interesting relationship. And that's been copied in so many movies, that whole idea. Of, All right. Well, I'm well I, no, you. Edwin, I'm going to ask you. What did you think? I haven't. I don't really remember Classified. I just haven't seen it in many, many years. I do remember liking it as a kid. I just remember it being, it was, like you said, some problems with the pacing. It's a little slow. But I think that the performances, I think Humphrey Bogart, I mean, hell, it's a signature role. He, the reason he's remembered it for a reason, you know. I mean, that's but why? The, I mean, I'm watching this thinking, why? You know what I think has happened? It's, it's, I mean, not to bring up Vertigo again. When I first saw Vertigo, I knew immediately what was going to go because it's been ripped off so many times. That mm -hmm. plot has been ripped off, but it was so good. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't mind. That, by the way, Vertical was based on Why a book. Why do we keep calling it Vertical? By it's the vertigo. Same. Vertigo. I said Vertigo. 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 Yeah, but, but so that, that, that book that Vertical was based on was based on a book by the same writer who wrote Diable Week. Not surprising. And originally he came to Hitchcock to do Diable Week. And his name's Pierre Boyer. Pierre, yeah. And he also did Plan the Apes, let's not forget. But, um, but no, um, I'm interesting. <laughs> yeah, how did he go from there? You're the Armand White of Planet of the Apes. <laughs> no, he wrote Planet of the Apes. I think it's a very interesting career. Diabolique, Vertigo. To well, let's talk about something. Let's talk. Let's 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 break. What do you think of something like Citizen Kane? Do you think that's deserving of its greatest movie of all time? Yes, I do. yes, I do. Yes, yeah. Even I do. if you don't like the movie, <laughs> right. anybody? Even if you don't like the movie, you have to look at the directorial techniques of Orson Welles. Every single thing in there that you talk talk about blueprints. That is the blueprint for modern filmmaking. As far as I'm concerned, I completely agree with you. So it's funny. I wouldn't consider it my favorite Orson Welles film. I already think I know what yours is. I bet you don't. Well, it's not like Bellow. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Third Man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, actually, no. He didn't direct. No, it, no, no, no. He didn't direct the third. But he, I mean, and it's not the Carol And if it's not the magnificent Ambersons, I'm a white rabbit. What the? Who is Saturday? Am I part of this? Who's watching Paul Lynn? No, you just saw you just saw the Halloween special. No, no. What what makes? There's one scene in Citizen Kane which makes it the most, the, possibly the best, most influential film ever made. You guys aren't going to know what I'm talking about. But you mentioned Rose, but I'm just punching it. No, 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 no. It's a scene after uh, Charles Foster Kane's mistress makes her opera debut and it's an absolute failure. And Joseph Cotton plays his best friend, the drama critic, on his paper. And instead of writing the review, he gets drunk. And there's that scene where like uh, Charles Foster Kane's in the foreground typing up the review for him. Joseph Cotton is in the background. Okay. In those days, there was no such thing as a lens that could put both people in focus. So he had it, that's a special effect. That is the first split screen effect ever used in film. So they shot a close up of, of Orson Welles and then later shot on the same set of, um, a long shot of Joseph Cotton and they splice the two scenes together so they're not in the room at the same time. They managed the shot. They managed the shot. Yeah, that's interesting it's, because my favorite uh, scene in Citizen Kane was where he was eating a roast beef sandwich. And the, really? Was that a special thing? Actually, I was going to mention a scene where he was I just like roast beef sandwiches. No, there's an amazing a scene. By the way, we got a sandwich back there. Does anyone want some sandwiches? Jeff's mother made it. I'm fine. Jeff's mother made the sandwich. Jeff's mother made a kick-ass sandwich. I had a bite. It's good. Uh, well, when we do a show on Jeff's mother and her sandwiches, she makes fuck it. I'm bringing the pigs in a blanket over. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I want to recommend something too on Sears of Can. If you do see it, watch it with the commentary. It's one of the best commentaries. He talks about how he achieved many of these tricks that Eric was talking is about. Is that only two disc DVD? Yes, it is. There's if audience. anybody, if there's anybody is going to, uh, no, no. There's a scene where they talk about where there's a scene with the camera move, and yeah. they pull a table apart and put it back together just so the camera goes through it. Fascinating, you would never notice it. Well, it's if brilliant. anybody's going to be able to talk about uh, uh, Citizen Kane, it's Roger Ebert, because he's supposedly seen this film 127 times. Well, I respect his contract. I learned so much from it. I mean, if, you, if you just say you fucking hate the movie, fuck it. Just watch it to listen to learn how Orson Welles achieved many of these tricks without even... He, he learned these on his own. These were all invented on, you know, making as he went along. And it's brilliant because everyone has used these shots. And it's, I can't recommend it. Well, them. like, what, you know, what you're mentioning with Citizen Kane on why it holds up and why it is still a classic and everything is why I was anti-Casablanca. Because he uses not only wonderful acting, and you can tell the direction is very driven, with Casablanca, there was nothing really technical about that film. There was no uh, shots that were astounding or whatever, and, and well, that was my whole thing. I was waiting for something that Michael Curtis did not do. Well, I guess, well, the thing when that... Did, when did Casablanca made, come out? Was that 39? I believe it was, it was 41. 42, I believe. Okay, yeah. so then it was later in Citizen Kane. Yes, it was. It was so, in the midst of World War II. Well, well the thing that, that uh, got me with the story was that it uh, had so many elements uh, that or genres from other films. It had a romance. It had, I mean, not a lot of action, but it did have action. Don't say film noir. No, I wasn't no, going to use film noir. It's, no, not, oh, it's not a film noir. It had a, sort of a spy film feel of the early era. Mm -hmm. So I felt all those things connecting kind of made it I'll, I was almost going to pay it a compliment and say it, 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 it had little elements of John le Carre, but no. no, no John le Carre before there was a John le Carre. Yeah, 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 you're but, pushing it. All right, yeah. I want to ask you something. Now, this is a good one. We were talking earlier about Alfred Hitchcock. Now, Alfred Hitchcock has made many great movies. Is there a movie 
Because he's probably the most famous director of his time. He's even more famous. I mean, nobody is more famous. Wait, than uh, uh, yeah. Who, now he's made many films. Many, almost all his films are considered classics. Is there one that you think that really fails to make the cut? I have one. So but it's you? also his last film. So you can see why. Maybe it's Burton? No, no, no sometimes it's our family plot. Yes, family, family plot. plot. Oh, yeah. Which is interesting. It's not a horrible movie. But I wouldn't put it with the classics. Now, I love Bruce Dern. But just sitting through the film, it just felt like... Coop, I mean, not Coop, sorry. Hitchcock was kind of on autopilot at that. I mean, he was elderly. But but it feels like a made for TV. Well, I think about exactly. it, the thing about it is I don't, no one really considers that a classic. But actually, you know what? I like that better than another film he did, which is Topaz. Well, see, I've never seen Topaz. Topaz, uh, Topaz has a trouble with really. Well, Topaz and Torn Curtain, actually. Uh, Torn Curtain is like basically his, his attempt to do another North by Northwest, another 39 Steps, but with Paul Newman. And it's just... Paul Newman's really miscast in the role. And Julie Andrews, too. Julie Andrews is actually better cast than Paul Newman. Paul Newman just, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work as a Nobel-winning scientist who's supposed to defect or fake his defection to the East to get some special planet. It has one of the worst scenes in after Hitchcock history, actually. Well, it has, well, you talk about the death thing where he tries to kill the guy? In the oven? Yeah, but that's considered the only good thing in the movie. Oh, that's hysterically <laughs> bad. It's like, ah! the whole point. Well, the whole point of it was Hitchcock wanted to show how, abs how absolutely difficult it is to murder a person. And, and that's considered the only good scene in the entire film. But Topaz is a mess. Okay, wait Topaz a second. Wait a second. Was, Topaz was hold on. Okay, I'll get to we, Topaz. We got, we got started with this conversation because of Jeff. And we're going to do Jeff. a Hitchcock episode anyway. Yeah. Well, I think because I thought because everything that Hitchcock has right. touched is considered a high right. quality. Yeah. Like, I would say, like, what is one, like, some people say The Birds. The Birds is a masterpiece. Some people say it's not because of the script issues. Well, I can see where but you're coming gonna, from. Where you're gonna say but that. I just want to put forth Jeff. Yes. Why did you want us to do this topic? There was one movie in particular you wanted oh, to Oh, yes. Discuss. One movie in particular. I want to bring this back to the origin Cause, of Because he wants to argue this because he already knows which one I'm going to pick. Revolution. No, no, I haven't even seen that. No, it's a little film that has been considered a classic that I sat through and absolutely, I'm not going to say hate, but I can see why it's considered a classic, but I couldn't stand it, and that movie is called Easy Rider. With uh, directed wow. by Dennis Hopper, sorry Dennis Hopper, Peter Fonda, and made Jack Nicholson a star. I really don't think there's many very good of those, you know, uh, what is it, those motorcycle movies. I tried to watch a few of them. I just don't. Like That's that. not a motorcycle movie. But it, it, Easy you know, is different. it really started it's opening not, up that like the not, new generation. You can't really compare it. Oh, it is. I read the because I read the whole story. I mean, that was originally supposed to be an AIP film. Yeah, but it's not, an, you know, it's, that is not like, it's not a biker film. It's yeah, not, it's not, you know, it's not like film. a hippie LSD. It's not, it's not like, it's like it's more tries to make social commentary. It's not like the wild ones. But I mean, I can. What did you what What did you not like about it? What was it about of that disappointing? I guess it's sort of like the book On the Road. I can see why people consider it a classic, but sitting there watching it for myself or reading On the Road myself, to me, it just seemed like Easy Rider was just patched together as they were filming. And most likely they were higher drunk most of the time that they were making the film. And what you're saying is pretty much reality. true. I know, but it's, I'm sorry, I don't find that entertaining. Because if I did that now, I understand at the time it's thought of as revolutionary. Because it really opened up America's eyes to, you know, the hippie movement. And the, but the hippie but, movement but, isn't necessarily shown in a good light either. But, it wasn't, but what, it wasn't so much that, though. Is What this was is America's first taste of what was going on with the, uh, the what is it, uh, the no, 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 no. In the uh, the uh, cinema nouveau from France, you know, the uh, the the French new wave. Yeah, it's like you took that and you added it, and, and you added American flavor to it and perspective and everything. And of course, you're mixing the countercultural stuff in there too. Um, and you it, get well. The, it's the first film that was successful that had that, but that's not the first. Because I was going to say, but Clyde I mean, it, but it was also the first film uh, that was really one of a kind that was put out by an American director and American distributor. I mean it had these elements where they were where there were real scenes being put forth in there. I mean, you know, we've read the book mm -hmm. on uh, Easy Riders and Raging Bulls right. and talked about what a like even though Dennis Hopper did have an artistic vision for this film, it was really piecemeal and put together. Exactly. But there are so many I just don't understand how you can there's some things that I look and I like my breath catches in my mouth like when uh, when they're uh, going I think in uh, in Wyoming or or no no they're in the, around the Rockies or something and their choppers are pulling around and you hear the band with that very famous song the weight I mean that to me is just an amazing mix like a, almost like a Scorsese where you mix a perfect scene with the music another reason why that film 
hit the way it did, was so successful, was the timing when it was made. Because there were American films trying to do the verite, the whole European sensibility thing behind it. It just weren't, weren't as successful. The reason why Easy Rider hit was the timing. Everyone forgets the whole hippie 60s, all that stuff, only existed really for two years. And then you had stuff happen like Alma, you know, the, the Rolling Stones concert. Where they hired, for the hippies. Right, right. And then you had, you know, Kent State. And then you had all this stuff. And then, and then the final thing to put the nail in the coffin, Charles Manson. But and this is it's, a real and so time this film came, film, well, this film came out and really capitalized on what everybody was thinking and going through emotionally at that time. But it's time. not, but to say it, but it's, it's, it's a motorcycle it's film. Problem. No, I agree with well, you. It's it, not just it's a the motorcycle. Pacing, and it's it's not very, I think it's I think it's something that's a film that's better in theory than actually watching it. Well the movie they said in the book is it was a mess. I mean they shot so much footage, Dennis Hopper was out of his mind. But you haven't seen the movie. I have seen the movie. Oh you have seen the movie. I have seen the movie movie numerous times. Um, and as I said, there was so much footage, I just had to edit it to make it somewhat coherent. And even, I don't think he's completely happy with the way it turned out. But, I mean, it got out there, it made a lot of money, and then he fucked it up for the next movie he made, which is the last movie. I mean, it's, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's a massive movie, but I will say, there were scenes in that that still exist to this day that have been parodied. parodied. You know, with, with it, what is it, Born Be Wild, when everyone played, you know, they made fun of it in Lost in America, very funny. But I mean, I mean, I'm not saying it's a totally horrible film. No, it's not. Um, it's just I'm just saying, exactly, it just doesn't live up to all the hype that it's gotten over the years. Because I can name three things I really like about it. The ending, and not because of, you know, I was happy it ended, but that's a powerful scene. I'm not going to ruin it. I mean, Jack Nicholson, of course. We uh, well, I like Jack Nicholson. I mean, the image of him on the back of a motorcycle, instead of wearing a regular helmet, wearing a football helmet, I really enjoy that. And I enjoy the scene where, you know, Peter Fonda, sa Fonda says, we blew it. Those are the three things that stand out in my mind. The rest of it, just, uh, it comes in, it comes out, but I can honestly say I would never watch it. What's your debate against this? What is it that you do like? What, what, I, what I'm well. saying is, is you can't, you know, you're saying that the film works better in theory. Whereas I'm saying, uh, I could say that some of the parts are greater than the whole, but I'm still saying that the whole film is, I, I'm sure there's, there's really odd parts, like when they're in New Orleans and he's tripping and he's in the arms of the statue and he's railing against his mother. And that was actually a real... Uh, that was a real scene where he was tripping and he was raging against the fact that his mother had committed suicide and so on and so forth. So that wasn't the character, that was actually really Peter Fonda. And you know, as you're watching this, you're thinking, where the hell is this going? But there's just so many moments and, and I think what the film does perfectly is it, is it captures that disillusionment with, with uh, society at that time and with America in general oh. and it shows that these guys their American dream was so hollow and so pointless that they kind of met their end at the end because yeah, they were jumping in there. Okay, in there, but I guess what I'm asking I can understand your point I'm not saying you're wrong or anything but would you put Easy Rider in the class like in your classics of all time next to some of your favorite or what you think yes. of the best film? Yes. so you put it next to Citizen Kane yes well, see, I all I'm saying is I don't feel that way, but I still like the film. This film. Did you like Clerks better? No. Well, then Easy Rider. Yeah. Yes. I will honestly. I will put oh, it out there. Oh, dude, yeah. I'm getting out of here for Mike. Yes, uh, I'm getting out of here. But that's my personal opinion. But if you ask me, which was a better made I'm stuck, film, here. I will get give, out, get out, I will give you the credit out. that Easy Rider is a better made film. But if you ask me which one I enjoyed better and which one I would rather watch again, I will say Clarence. All right, I have a question. But Orson this, Welles or Kevin Smith? That's an easy question. Orson Welles. Thank you. Okay, okay. There is help for you. You know, to even mention both names in the same sentence. <laughs> but, you know, I'm not sitting here saying, but obviously, since we've had this argument um, before, I'm not saying Clerks is a classic either. But if you ask me which one I'd rather watch, I'm going to be truthful with you. I'd rather sit through Clerks than Easy Rider. Mike, you must be really... No, like, here, here's an interesting question I have for Mike. Would you rather sit through Clerks again or watch Casablanca? Uh, I would rather watch Casablanca. Okay. Do you have Do you have like a like? Is there a message film that is successful in spirit that would be considered a classic? I mean, you got something like most of them are dated, like something like To Kill a Mockingbird, which is considered a classic. That's a bit of a message that, film. That's really overstated. Oh, I'll give you the best one. I think it's the most overrated. Actually, piece I disagree. Of shit. I think it's a great. No, movie. no, not Mark Mockingbird. Yeah. That's a decent movie. Yeah, Gregory Peck's amazing. That. Uh, Gentleman's Agreement. That is yes. a piece of shit. I love that. I've never seen it. I, I, for its time, I could see what was interesting, but it I is think it's a very powerful so I don't think it's a piece but of shit. Very, very powerful well, message. I guess. Film, though. If it I had carries a very powerful message. And, and that, that, is a, that is a film that I think is 
maybe not the most well-made film, but I'll tell you it's very important because anti-Semitism was very prominent in Hollywood at the time, and to make a That's film true. like that at the time was very brave. But, but most of the people in Hollywood were Jewish at that time. Right, exactly, but there was still, yeah, well, all the studio, yeah, all the screenwriters, and the studio chiefs as well, but exactly. there was still, but they, but they, but they, even, it was like a self-loathing Jew thing, because they perpetuated the myth of white, Christian, kind of waspy heroes and heroines. Well, their guy was Almighty Dollar. They didn't want to I mean, hey, you audience. could also say that most of the people in Hollywood are gay, too, but there was no That's real gay-friendly <laughs> filmmaking out there. And if you think about so it, that, that supposedly, uh, we're not making any general statements. You didn't, you didn't get any real Jewish lead men until, like, world. the late 40s exactly. and early 50s with, like, uh, who, Tony uh, Curtis and is, Kirk Douglas. Who was the first Jewish leading man, really, now that you think, make me think about that? That's a very good Well, Clark question. Gable wasn't. Rudolph Valentino wasn't. Well, Kirk Douglas was. Kirk, Kirk Douglas, Douglas, Tony Curtis, Gregory Peck was not. Um, some of the silent guys were, most definitely. I mean, some of those guys came from Charlie Michigan, Chaplin. You know, true. Um, well, speaking of which, I mean, we're going on all these serious movies. What about like uh, the great class of comedians and stuff like that? Oh, do they the, deserve the Marx their Brothers. reputation? Yeah, sure. Marx Brothers. I think the Marx Brothers are fucking brilliant. Yeah, they are. Duck Soup. And Duck Soup is one of my favorite all-time. Night movies. at the Opera. Uh, I love a Night at the Opera. I prefer. I, I actually, my favorite one is Duck Soup only because it's the only film where they don't try to force a romance onto it, where there's no romantic subplot. And it's you just know, all anarchy, the entire film. All I'll say is, is the Marx Brothers didn't look Jewish. Um, Edwin, what do you... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, that'll bring this show to a close. Uh, we want to thank Eric for hosting us at this shindig. Of, no problem. You know, this nice shindig. Got some nachos. Have awesome. some of Jeff's mother's sandwich. I won't be able to leave. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll be, hopefully you'll see us here again soon, and uh, thank you for tuning in. Okay. Who's on your refrigerator here? Well, you got my you got my nephew and my niece and my grandmother and Richard Nixon and a Playboy bunny. Yeah. Well, at least your house doesn't smell like crap.